Welcome back to our lecture series, Linear Algebra Done Openly. As usual, I'm your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. You might have noticed in the previous lecture, 1.4, we were solving some systems of equations using the substitution technique. You could have done elimination as well. Um, and fortunately, the systems that we had to solve were pretty easy. And if you have been looking at the homework in the, in the book here, you'll notice that in some of the sections, like 1.4, you do have to solve systems of equations. And again, the examples given to us are fairly easy. You could solve it uh, using elementary techniques like substitution or elimination. But the thing is, these are kind of Mickey Mouse type problems, right? Uh, they deliberately have been made easier for us, knowing that at this moment of the course, we might not have an effective strategy for solving systems of linear equations. Well, we're going to need some way of solving linear systems. We've seen that working with linear combinations, working with linear transformations naturally leads to solving linear systems. So in this section and in the next section, 1.6, we're going to be trying to develop a, an effective algorithm for solving systems of linear equations. And so in this lecture, we're going to introduce the elementary row operations and augmented matrices as a tools to help us work with uh, with the systems of linear equations. So the three elementary row operations, they have uh, many names and some textbooks don't give them any names at all. Um, the names that we are going to use uh, in this textbook are actually borrowed from David Lay's linear algebra textbook. And he calls the three row operations the following. Uh, the first one he calls replacement, where replacing uh, the replacement operation, you're going to replace one row by the sum of itself and a multiple of another row. Or in other words, you're going to add a multiple of one row into another. And when I say row here, right, what, why do we call these row operations? You can think of that each equation of the linear system is the row in the system. This will make much more sense when we talk about augmented matrices because these rows will literally be rows of a matrix, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So the replacement operation occurs by adding a multiple of a row to another row. In other words, you're replacing a row with the original row plus a multiple of another. That one seems a little bit complicated, but when we do some examples, I think it'll clarify very, very quickly. It turns out the replacement operation is the one we're going to be doing the most often. Uh, the second row operation is we call interchange. You're going to interchange the order of any two rows. So if you have like the first row and the second row, you can swap them. The second row becomes first and the first becomes second. You know, if you want the, the first to be last and the last to be first, uh, you can do that. Switching the, switching the rows um, is, is allowed. And the last one we call scaling. Uh, the reason we call that is you can multiply any uh, row that is, you can multiply any row, uh, which is an equation, you can multiply it by some non-zero scalar. The reason you don't want to multiply by zero is that it would actually just demolish your equation, right? If you multiply any equation by zero, you're going to end up with zero equals zero. And the solution to this equation is everything, right? Uh, and so multiplying by zero kind of devastates and changes the solution set. This actually leads me to my next point. Uh, we say that two linear systems of equations are row equivalent if there's some sequence of row operations, replacement, interchange, and scaling, some sequence of row operations that transforms the first linear system into the other linear system, the row equivalent systems. Now, this is it, what's important about row equivalence is that row equivalence is the same thing as equivalence, which equivalence, as we defined before, this means that they have the same solution set. So performing row operations on a system of linear equations does not change the solution set of this system. Um, and some of these are kind of easy to see. Interchange, you're switching the order of the equations. That shouldn't have any consequence. As I was mentioning before, like if you do, you know, if you multiply both sides of the equation by the same value, uh, that's not going to change the solution as long as it wasn't zero because that just demolishes the equation. Basically, you just throw it in the shredder at that point. Replacement is a little bit harder to see, but if you start adding, to, if two rows have common solutions, when you add them together, you'll have a common solution. Uh, this was a, something we talked about when we showed that the uh, set of linear equations forms itself a vector space. Um, taking linear combinations of equations with common solutions will keep those same common solutions. So it turns out that two linear systems are equivalent if and only if they're row equivalent. So we can use row equivalency to help us solve systems of linear equations. And I want to give you an example of such a thing. Consider the following three by three system. It has three equations, aka 
three rows. It has three variables, aka three columns. Again, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. So in this linear system, we have the first equation, x1 minus 2x2 plus 2x3 equals 0. The second equation is 2x2 minus 8x3 equals negative 8. And the last one is negative 4x1 plus 6x2 plus 2x3 equals 10. And so what I'm going to do is start performing some row operations. Um, not exactly motivated why. I just want to demonstrate to you how do you actually do the row operations. So with this system right here, right, we're going to just... Uh, we're going to take this system of equations, and I want to perform the following row operation. We're going to replace row 3 with row 3 plus 4 times row 1. So this is a replacement operation. Row 3 is going to be replaced with row 3 plus 4 times row 1. This is a little bit of shorthand I use a lot. Uh, we're going to write next to the row we're replacing, row 3, which is what you have to take the multiple of itself, plus a multiple of another row. And how does one do this? We have to actually first consider, well, what is 4 times row 1 even mean? Uh, this would mean you multiply everything in, this, in the equation by 4. So you get 4x1 times 8x2 plus 8x3 equals 0. And then you have to add this to row 3. And if you do that, you're going to get 4, a negative 4x1. They'll cancel with the 4x1 so you don't see anything here. You're going to get 6x2 minus negative 8x2. And so that gives you a negative 2x2. And then you get a 2x3 plus an 8x3. That gives you a 10x3. And then 10 plus 0 is 10. So we can add those things together. Now that itself kind of takes a lot of space on the page. And so we're tempted to not, we don't want to use so much space on the page. Um, another option, you can just try to do everything in your head. I don't advise, I don't advise that too well. So one thing you're going to see me a lot do is that I'm actually going to take 4R1 and using a different color, like maybe red or something, I'm going to write as a superscript the coefficient above it. So x1 times 4 is going to give you 4x1. So I'm just going to write a 4 right there. Uh, next, we're going to take the negative 2 times it by 4. You get a negative 8. Uh, then you're going to take 2 times 4, which is an 8. And then you can take 0 times 4, which is 0. So you just write the numbers you have to add, just like a superscript above it right there. And then you can add those together very nicely, giving us the, the 0x1, negative 2x2, 10x3, and 10, like we did before. So that was our first row operation. That's a replacement operation. Uh, the next operation, and I should mention that when you connect these things together, uh, you draw these little, these little squiggles to show that the two systems are row equivalent because they're not equal. The two systems are not the same, but they are equivalent to each other. So the little squiggle means the solution set's been preserved. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to take row 2 and we're going to multiply it by a factor of 1 half. We're using the scaling operation. So I'm going to take row 2 and times it by 1 half. Oh, I, I need to do that above, don't I? We're going to multiply this one by 1 half. And so notice why I did this. Everything in this row is a multiple of 2. 2x2, 8x3, negative 8. If you times by 1 half or divide by 2, same thing. Um, we can then replace it with this row right here. x2 minus 4x3 is equal to negative 4. We divided every coefficient by 2. That is what the scaling operation is all about. Uh, we had done the replacement operation up here. Next, what I want to do is I'm going to do replacement again. I'm going to replace row 3, the current row 3, not the original row 3. I'm going to replace the current row 3 with row 3 plus 2 times row 2. So I'm going to take row 3 and replace with it row 3 plus 2 times row 2. So following the convention we did before, we're going to take row 2. So 1 times, so one times 2 is a 2. Negative 4 times 2 is a negative 8. Don't forget the sign. And negative 4 times a 2 is a negative 8 again. So when you add these together, the 2s will cancel. So there is no x2 in now. Um, you're going to get 10x3 take away 8x3. That's going to be a 2x3. And then you're going to get 10 minus 8, which is a 2, like so. And so with these three operations we did, we did replacement, scaling, then replacement again. We now have a system of equation that looks like the following. And I want to notice, I want to point out to you the following observation. Look at the last equation. The last equation only depends on x3. I could solve for that very quickly. Um, divide both sides by 2, right? You're going to see that x3 is equal to 1. Oh, that's pretty convenient. But also what we see here is if I know what x1 is, the second equation only depends on x2 and x3. If I could plug in 
x3 into that equation, I could solve for x2. And doing that gives me the following. Notice that x2 is going to equal 4x3 minus 4. I just solve for x3 right there. And then plug in 1, you get 4 minus 4, which is equal to 0. So x2 is equal to 0. But now look at the first equation. The first equation depends on x1, x2, and x3. I know what x3 is. I know what x2 is. I could plug those values to find an x1. So notice if you solve for x1, you're going to get x1 equals 2x2 minus 2x3. We know what x2 is. It's a 0. We know what x3 is. It's a 1. And so we see that x1 is going to be negative 2. So I've now solved this system of equations. If the solutions can be unique, it's negative 2, 0, and 1. This is a consistent linear system with a unique solution. And we found it using these raw operations. Huh? What did we do here? You'll notice that along the way, we were trying to simplify the, the system of equations. We kind of got rid of everything under this variable. We got rid of everything here. We kind of make this downward staircase. That's what we were trying to uh, create here. And once we got that, we were able to solve the system using this technique of back substitution. You could always, you could always solve for a variable, and then you back substitute it into the above equation, and then there's always one unknown in each of those equations, and so you just knock them off one by one by one until you find the solution. That's starting to show us how we can solve a system of equations, how we build this staircase. We'll focus on how you build the staircase in lecture 1.6, but for now, I just want to illustrate how one can use row operations to help you manipulate and solve systems of linear equations.